All right. Hello and formally welcome everybody to today's talk. My name is Meredith Shanda. I am the Chief Operating Officer for the Maven Project and wanted to thank everyone for joining us today, especially all our friends at Cherokee Health Systems for hosting today's session, which is a hypertension update for 2024 with Dr. Charles Schulman. Um, if those of you who haven't met Dr. Schulman before, he is an assistant clinical professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School from 1988 until 2016 currently a corresponding member of the faculty of Harvard Medical School and a senior physician at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. In addition, he's been practicing non-invasive cardiology since 1970. Uh, Dr. Shulman's scientific articles and abstracts have appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, Circulation, the American Journal of Cardiology, and the British Heart Journal. His research interests include the treatment of hypertension, congestive heart failure, and hyperlipidemia. And we are very grateful that he gives some of his time to Maven Project to share his expertise with us. So thank you again, Dr. Shulman, and I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Meredith. And good afternoon, everybody. Or uh, <laughs> or if you're not in the Eastern time zone, perhaps it's still good morning. <laughs> in any event, um, uh, today's talk is about uh, hypertension and some of the new, uh, uh, newer aspects of of this the topic that uh, uh, I would like to share with you. Um, uh, we have there are no conflicts of interest of uh, uh, in interest uh, for any of the individuals who have a uh, who have uh, been involved in this project. So I have no disclosures, nor do any, but nor do any of the other individuals involved in this project. <laughs> uh, as uh, Meredith said, the MAVEN project is accredited by the ACCME to provide continuing CME credits for physicians, and this is uh, designated uh, uh, for one credit. Uh, so what we I'd like to do uh, uh, in the course of the next uh, 45 uh, plus minutes uh, is to go over proper blood pressure uh, taking technique, uh, talk about blood pressure goals, uh, talk about strategies for both uh, in in initial and con subsequent uh, management, and uh, talk about secondary drivers and causes of hypertension, particularly hyperaldosteronism. Uh, to begin, um, uh, as we're all aware, uh, uh, hypertension is a pervasive problem. There are millions of people uh, who have hypertension. It's estimated uh, that 45% uh, of adults in the United States have blood pressures that are greater than 130 over 80. Um, uh, large numbers of those folks have uncontrolled hypertension, which is responsible for considerable numbers of deaths and considerable cost in terms of uh, treatment of the, of the blood pressure itself and, and the consequences thereof. Uh, as we age, uh, the number of people who have uh, high blood pressure uh, in increases. So, you know, in, in, in youth, there are only a few people who have hypertension. By the time you get to the 65, uh, uh, upwards of 60% uh, have uh, hypertension. Uh, wait, let me let me get my laser pointer. There we go. Okay. Uh, upwards of 60, 60 to 70% have hypertension. And over the age of 75, over three quarters of people uh, have hypertension. Um, this is uh, from the uh, 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 hypertension uh, treatment trialists, uh, a meta-analysis of 61 studies on over a million uh, adults. Now, what you see are a, a series of curves. Um, this is uh, systolic pressure. This is diastolic pressure uh, 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 showing the risk of ischemic heart disease mortality uh, with blood pressure. And there are a series of curves with age so that uh, uh, mortality goes up with uh, blood pressure and also with age. Um, uh, uh, as I said, uh, the 
uh, the, the association uh, between blood pressure and uh, eventual cardiovascular disease risk, uh, both for mortality, for stroke, for coronary heart disease, for myocardial infarction, uh, uh, when uh, compared with a normal blood pressure, uh, uh, the risk rises as blood pressure, again, as blood pressure goes up. Um, and uh, if there are what are called uh, hypertension-mediated organ, organ damage, uh, and th that those things, uh, renal dysfunction, carotid plaques, and, and left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, result in uh, increased numbers of major adverse cardiac events. Um, uh, there's a negative association with uh, renin-angiotensin system inhibitor uh, uh, drugs, uh, but a positive association with multiple sites of uh, 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 organ damage, antiplatelet therapy as, as a uh, measure of uh, 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 people ha having coronary disease and metabolic impairment. Um, I like to start the discussion about uh, what the what the goals are uh, with this particular research study. The SPRINT study was an NIH study involving uh, over 9,000 people, a randomized controlled trial, uh, examining the effect of a more intensive versus a less intensive uh, treatment regimen. So there, the groups were divided, the patients were divided, or not patients, subjects were divided into two groups, uh, one where the goal was uh, a standard treatment goal, uh, standard at the time, of uh, one uh, blood uh, systolic pressure under 140, and an intensive treatment group where the goal was a, a blood pressure of under 120. There were 35% females, uh, a third of them, or almost a third, were over the age of 75, and 30% were African Americans. The primary outcome was a composite, a composite outcome, uh, myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, heart failure, uh, or death from cardiovascular disease. Uh, these are inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, uh, and I, you should note that uh, diabetics were not included uh, in this trial because there was a previous trial, uh, an NIH trial with only diabetics. Uh, and here are the results. And uh, what you can see is there is a statistically significant difference in the primary outcome uh, 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 of the entire group and in all cause, all cause mortality. So even if you didn't die of coronary disease, you, 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 you lived longer. Um, uh, and that was all, uh, even more true in people who were over the age of 75. You see the different the differences the differences are even more um, thirty four percent uh, reduction in uh, uh, hazard ratio versus twenty five percent reduction. Uh, you know everything has its uh, cost and and the co there were uh, more adverse events in the older seventy five uh, year old group of uh, hypotension uh, and uh, falls. Uh, these this uh, are meta analyses uh, of different trials uh, showing the benefits of uh, blood pressure reduction. This is systolic, this is diastolic, and you can see that cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, uh, uh, heart failure, stroke, and all cause deaths were uh, significantly reduced. Uh, this is a, a, an interesting study that I found uh, from a couple of years ago in the Lancet. Uh, this is uh, uh, relates blood pressure lowering uh, and the risk of new onset type 2 diabetes from the blood pressure lowering treatment trialist group, uh, the group that, uh, that, I, that first slide came from. Uh, and what you see is that <laughs> that if uh, blood pressure is uh, controlled, there is less new onset diabetes, uh, particularly if drugs like angiotensin receptor and uh, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ARBs are used, uh, but not beta blockers. So that's that's one point in, fav in uh, 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 
uh, in favor of the idea that that you should not use beta blockers as as first line treatment for hypertension. Um, uh, when you see a patient uh, with hypertension, there are three questions to ask. Uh, uh, really before you start, not while you're measuring the blood pressure, but uh, before you start. Were you rushing to get here or physically active right before this appointment? Have you been taking your medicine? And, and what's your diet and physical activity regimen like? Now, if we turn to the actual measurement of blood pressure, this is the right, this is the right way to do it. Uh, relax for five minutes, uh, approximately. Uh, empty your bladder, no smoking, caffeine, or exercise prior, and in a quiet room with no talking during the measurement. Sit in a chair, feet on the ground, not legs crossed, back supported, blood pressure cuff at about heart, um, heart level. So this is the proper way to take blood pressure, and, and uh, uh, we, should, we should all... Uh, to use that, including our our uh, medical assistants who take take the vi vital signs uh, in the clinic before before we actually see, or in in our clinic anyway, before we actually see the patient. Um, so in 2017, uh, the ACC AHA uh, 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 created a committee uh, to produce a guideline for. Uh, blood pressure management. The previous guideline was JNC7 uh, 20 years prior. Uh, excuse me, not 20 years, only 15 years prior. Um, uh, in both of these, normal blood pressure is defined as a blood pressure of 120 over 80. And, and, and JNC7 from 120 to 140 was considered to be pre pre, what so called pre hypertension. And hypertension was diagnosed at a blood pressure of 140 over 90. Uh, the new guidelines dial that down so that uh, blood pressures between 120 and 130 uh, uh, are considered to be elevated. And stage one hypertension is now considered to be a blood pressure of uh, uh, over 130 over 80. That is, the definition of high blood pressure is 130 over 80. Um, salt intake has, has uh, uh, important effects on uh, blood pressure because it, uh, high dietary sodium uh, raises blood pressure. The, the mean sodium uptakes in the United States estimated somewhere between uh, 2,300 and 4,700 milligrams per day. Limiting salt intake lowers blood pressure and reduces extracellular volume. And this is uh, uh, from a study <clears throat> Uh, that showed uh, both systolic and diastolic uh, reduction by uh, limiting salt intake to uh, less than two grams a day, two two thousand milligrams or two grams a day, uh, both in uh, African American uh, and in non African American people, both with uh, prehypertension and hypertension itself. You know, um, con uh, strategies which are uh, uh, easy to follow uh, if, if, if we can uh, get our patients to uh, follow them would be to encourage people to read food levels, labels, you know, buy low sodium versions of food, stick to fresh foods as opposed to canned foods, uh, and cook without salt. Um, aldosterone has a, has a role in hypertension. Uh, because it causes sodium retention and volume expansion and the upregulating of angiotensin II receptors and a potentiation uh, of the pressor responses to angiotensin II. So, but uh, this emphasized that it leads to extracellular volume expansion. One clue is hypokalemia. So low normal or low potassium uh, even despite a potassium sparing agent or, or potassium supplements um, uh, is, a, is a clue that hyperaldosteronism is part of the problem. 
Um, now, uh, there are a number of uh, early markers of hypertensive cardiovascular disease, uh, or uh, uh, what I previously referred to as uh, target organ damage. Um, uh, those would include an exaggerated blood pressure response to exercise on a, on a stress test. So if the blood pressure is um, uh, over, if the blood pressure is uh, over uh, uh, 220 in, in men, uh, uh, 210 in men and, and 190 in women on the stress test, that's, that's a hype, that's an exaggerated response. And then there's the loss of the nocturnal dip. Okay, oops, okay, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the loss of the nocturnal dip. So uh, uh, we have, there. there is a circadian variation in both hemodynamics and catecholamine levels in our, our bodies about circadian, about 24 hours. It's actually about uh, closer to 25 hours. Um, uh, so that uh, during the day, both uh, blood pressure, uh, pulse rate uh, and uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine are are increased, and then they fall when we go to sleep. So that at about four in the morning, they reach their lowest lowest levels. Well, you know the the catecholamines and also heart rate and blood pressure. Um, uh, and this, but some people don't don't have that that nocturnal dip, right? Called by the British non-dippers. Okay, so this would be uh, a, 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 a tracing of a person who, who, who. Th this would be a, tra a, a tracing. This would be a tracing of a person who had that nocturnal dip in blood pressure, and this would be one uh, uh, of a person that did not. Um, uh, people who have, as an example, people who have uh, sleep apnea, who never really get a full night's sleep uh, can have this very common. And it's one of the associations of sleep apnea and uh, uncontrolled hypertension. Um, and in this meta-analysis of 17,000 people, a blunted nocturnal uh, blood pressure decline uh, led to adverse uh, cardiac events. Uh, the cardiac causes, or cardiac uh, markers, I should say, uh, of uh, hypertensive cardiovascular disease include uh, left ventricular hypertrophy either by ECG or by echocardiogram, uh, reduced uh, diastolic relaxation, that is diastolic dysfunction, uh, coronary artery calcium, which is a sign of coronary artery disease, right? You can't have calcium in your coronary arteries if you don't have coronary artery disease. Uh, and then there are vascular uh, manifestations, renal manifestations, and retinal artery changes. Turning to treatment, uh, this is the 2017 hypertension guideline uh, as uh, recommended by the uh, ACC AHA uh, guideline that I've uh, shown you. Uh, this shows the treatment th thresholds for adults, and it's divided into two groups of uh, people, those with a low risk and those with a higher risk. The general concept is you apply the most intensive treatment to those with a high, the highest risk. Uh, but starting with those at low risk, for elevated blood pressure, uh, a heart-healthy lifestyle is recommended. For stage one hypertension, uh, blood pressures of 130 to 139, uh, uh, one would intensif uh, intensify the lifestyle manifestation and begin pharmacologic therapy uh, um, with blood pressures over 140 over 90. If the risk is greater than 10%, or the patient has diabetes or chronic kidney disease, uh, the recommendation in the elevated blood pressure range is, is the same, but blood pressure uh, drug therapy is recommended beginning at a, a systolic pressure of 130. Um, 
There have been questions about uh, how to apply these uh, guideline blood pressure goals to older people. The American Heart Association, you know, the AH, ACC, the College of Cardiology and Heart Association, uh, suggests that we lower systolic pressure to 130 to 139 with caveats, that is, if it's well tolerated, and taking into account biologic age, comorbidities, frailty, and dependency. Uh, the European Society of Cardiology has a similar recommendation, lower systolic blood pressure to less than 140 um, uh, millimeters of mercury for patients over the age of 70 uh, and down to 130 if it's tolerated. Uh, they point out that uh, systolic blood pressure or, uh, uh, should not be uh, consistently under 120. Um, the American Association of, uh, for, uh, the American Academy of Family Practice uh, didn't really buy into the ACC AHA recommendations uh, until a year, about a year ago. Uh, and their new guideline from a year ago uh, uh, recommends that we treat adults with systolic pressures over 140 uh, uh, millimeters of mercury to a goal of under 140 or under 135. Uh, most studies that, that, that have been tre uh, 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 published over the years show that uh, blood pressures, uh, lowering blood pressure to under 140 over 90 is beneficial, even though, even for people who are over the age of 80. Um, the point being that it's never too old uh, to treat blood pressure. Uh, since 2017, there have been a number of uh, studies which have uh, uh, yielded uh, the, uh, some of the following uh, uh, findings. I'm not going to read them all, uh, but one of one major one is the emphasis on home blood pressure monitoring or out of or out of office blood pressure readings. Uh, I use this uh, all the time, but uh, uh, because many people. Uh, when they come to the office, will have a higher pressure than they have at all. Uh, and so I have people take their blood pressures frequently and record them and <laughs> bring the paper into, into their next visit. <laughs> um, uh, all adults with, adult, with difficult to control the resistant hypertension should be screened for primary aldosteronism. Yes, and we're going to talk more about that. Uh, to treat uh, earlier because uh, young, younger adults uh, uh, with, with uncontrolled hypertension may have an earlier onset of cardiovascular uh, events. Lifestyle uh, modification uh, both treats and improves the effectiveness of uh, pharmacologic therapy. Um, and um, they emphasize, there, there is now an, a, a stronger emphasis on multi-level, multi-component implement, implementation strategies, including team-based care. So it doesn't depend only on uh, uh, the, the primary provider, but also on ancillary uh, help as well. You can have your patient you know, if your schedule is, is uh, uh, booked, have the patient come in, have one of the uh, medical assistants take their blood pressure, for example, uh, you know, you record it that way. But the, but the more, the more uh, interaction we have with our patients, uh, the more likely we are to achieve effective uh, blood pressure control. Um, now, turning to non-pharmacologic interventions, uh, for the prevention and treatment of hypertension, we start with uh, weight loss. Uh, the goal is obviously to, to achieve ideal body weight, and it's been shown that for every kilogram of, uh, blood pr of uh, weight reduction, there's a one millimeter uh, uh, blood pr uh, mercury blood pressure reduction. Uh, two articles which just came out yesterday um, uh, uh, and, and enforce this. Uh, one is a, a five-year study following bariatric surgery, where uh, almost half of the patients were able to get off blood pressure medicines entirely. Uh, so they were considered to be in, quote, remission. Uh, and their blood pressures were controlled without medicine. Uh, another one uh, that was just reported 
uh, is from the uh, surmount trial of terzepatide, terzepatide which uh, brand name is uh, Monjaro. Um, uh, people achieved uh, 15 to 20 percent weight of uh, their body weight, weight loss, uh, and significant blood pressure uh, lower. So uh, significant body weight reduction can certainly lead to uh, uh, blood pressure lowering. Uh, the DASH dietary pattern emphasizes fruits, vegetables, and is a low fat. A Mediterranean type diet it would be similar. That's uh, been associated with uh, blood pressure lowering, reducing dietary sodium uh, uh, with, an, uh, with an optimal goal of 1500 milligrams a day. But uh, if people are really abusing the salt, getting them under 2,000 two, two milligrams a day uh, uh, will go a long way. Uh, increase in, in dietary potassium helps. Uh, increasing physical activity. Uh, uh, so an exercise program is actually more effective uh, in reducing blood pressure in hypotensives than it is in normotensives. Um, alcohol consumption should be moderate. If you have, if you ingest three three drinks a day or more, it's harder to control blood pressure. And uh, uh, if you have sleep apnea, uh, uh, wearing a CPAP mask for at least four hours a night has been shown uh, to reduce uh, blood pressure. Uh, the choice of therapy in hypertension, at least for uh, initial therapy, uh, uh, doesn't depend on the drug itself. That is to say, the major determinant of uh, cardiovascular disease risk reduction uh, is the amount of blood pressure reduction, not the choice of drug. Okay, and this this has been emphasized. This is an article that appeared not too long ago. Um, uh, a follow-up, 21-year follow-up of the uh, all-hat trial. The all-hat trial was um, uh, completed in, I, I believe, I believe, 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, what you see, there were three uh, blood pressure groups, about 10,000 people in each group: chlorothaladone, amlodipine, and lisinopril. And what you can see is you know, cardiovascular disease mortality uh, uh, risk is about the same for each group. Uh, at the time. Uh, uh, all of the different uh, drugs, uh, drug companies were trying to prove that their drug was better than all the other drugs. But in, uh, as we can see, uh, uh, it doesn't matter which drug you use. It just matters whether you get the blood pressure down. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. There are always exceptions. And nothing is 100%. Um, uh, uh, one trial was the accomplished trial where uh, benazapril and uh, amlodipine uh, uh, led to better outcomes than benazapril and uh, hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, and in patients who have comorbid conditions that may have non-blood pressure indications for certain medicines, uh, uh, you would you would want to alter your therapy accordingly. For example. Uh, patients with heart failure or with reduced ejection fraction or diabetes, uh, an ACE inhibitor or an ARB is, uh, would be uh, have another indication besides uh, their blood pressure. Uh, for patients with atrial fibrillation, AV noble blocking drugs would be uh, indicated. Uh, post myocardial infarction, a beta blocker is indicated. Uh, for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, um, uh, 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 spironolactone uh, is indicated. Yeah, you know, each class of uh, antihypertensive medicines, when they were compared with each other, gave a good blood pressure response in something like 30 to 50 percent of patients, and the next one would also uh, do the same. There's a wide interpatient uh, uh, variability. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so the approach would be uh, something like this. Uh, uh, counsel on, on, on blood pressure, uh, the importance of blood pressure management uh, and setting goals. Uh, 
uh, is, is the blood pressure, is the systolic pressure greater than 20 milligrams, uh, tell me, uh, blood is the blood pressure greater than 20 over 10 above goal? If not, uh, if there is no proteinuria, then institute uh, either an uh, ACE inhibitor or an ARB or a dihydropyridine uh, calcium channel blocking agent as your first treatment. If there is um, uh, proteinuria, start with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Uh, if your blood pressure is greater than 20 over 10 above the goal, you can start with two drugs at the same time. Um, uh, I have not been doing that. I have been using one, doing one at a time, uh, uh, but in, in, you know because I've always felt that uh, if you you give two drugs at the same time and person has a side effect, you don't know which one is causing the side effect. Um, uh, but uh, either way, uh, it, it, you know the idea is to get the blood pressure down uh, 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 over time, but not over six months to a year, over uh, you know. One, one to three months. Uh, now, if the blood pressure remains uncontrolled after that, and uh, in, in, in this case, you know, in, or in these cases, uh, combined drugs. So, uh, and, and, and if, the, if the blood pressure remains uncontrolled, add a thiazide like diuretic. The point is uh, uh, reassess after two to four weeks. Don't wait three or six months. And don't uh, 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 succumb to uh, therapeutic in uh, inertia. Therapeutic inertia is where a patient comes in, their blood pressure is still high, and you don't change anything. Um, it's been shown uh, that combination therapy is better than the maximum dose of one medicine. Uh, so, so adding a second instead of uh, instead of pushing one medicine to its max. Uh, uh, either change medicines or uh, use the combination. The, major, the most common causes of lack of response are that the patient isn't taking his medicine or that there's white coat effect, uh, which is the major reason for measuring blood pressures uh, out of the office uh, and or at home uh, and improper blood pressure measurement. Uh, this just shows that in dapamide and uh, chlorothalidone, uh, lower blood pressure more than uh, uh, hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, this is uh, from the American Diabetes Association uh, uh, stand, uh, uh, standards of care, which they come out with every January. So this is from this is from last month. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, the Diabetes Association has similar recommendations. If the initial blood pressure is greater than 130 over 80 and less than 150 over 90, start one age uh, in addition to lifestyle management. If blood pressure is higher than that, start two agents. And the, the sequence would, would uh, uh, be similar to what I've just described. Uh, you know, their recommendation is to re reassess regularly. Uh, uh, mine would be to reassess every month uh, until until you achieve uh, uh, good blood pressure control. Okay. Yeah. Now, my my approach, my own approach to blood pressure goals. So, uh, you know, is to uh, not to let the controversy about what exactly the goal ought to be to keep you from initiating treatment in the first place. And don't let the patient tell you, I will, quote, I've always had high blood pressure, um, because that doesn't, <laughs> that's, that's still just as, just as hazardous if they always have had it. <laughs> we should try to lower it. Um, and use, use a stepwise approach. Aim for a systolic pressure of under 140 if you accomplish that without side effects. Aim for a systolic pressure of under 130. Again, smaller doses of two drugs may be more effective than pushing one drug to its maximum, and don't let therapeutic uh, inertia keep you from changing or uptitrating medicines. Now, uh, there are some secondary drivers of hypertension. <laughs> um, uh, uh, those include chronic kidney disease, medications, which I'll talk about more, uh, sleep apnea, 
and primary hyperaldosteronism. So you should look for primary hyperaldosteronism in people who have either severe or resistant hypertension, hypokalemia, uh, sleep apnea, and uh, atrial fibrillation that's otherwise unexplained. Uh, this is an algorithm uh, for the management of hypertension in patients with kidney chronic kidney disease, but we've we've already uh, gone through that. Uh, and you know, if the patient doesn't have uh, albuminuria, uh, use, use the usual first line medication choices <coughs> um, with a goal of under one hundred and thirty over eighty. If if they do have albuminuria, start with an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Uh, uh, and, and okay, um, and this is a, a a list of some common drugs. Not all, not 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 all inclusive, but it's some common drugs uh, which can increase blood pressure. Oral contraceptives can uh, uh, alcohol moderate or heavy alcohol intake. I've already mentioned uh, the biggest culprit are the NSAIDs. Uh, because people buy them over the counter and don't let don't tell you about it, uh, so that that can you know they they have arthritis and they take uh, you know they take uh, ibuprofen every day. Well, that can certainly raise their blood pressure. Uh, steroids can do it. <clears throat> uh, Sympathomimetics and and uh, amphetamine like substances can do it, and and stimulants like uh, cocaine uh, can do it. Um, now, turning to what's called resistant uh, or refractory hypertension, it's thought that uh, among people with hypertension, about 21% will turn out to be resistant. And of those, most can be controlled, and 3% of, the, of those will, will be uh, refractory. Uh, so this is resistant. It is defined as a blood pressure greater than 130 over 80, uh, despite three or more drugs. Uh, refractory is despite four or more drugs. <clears throat> uh, you know, causes, suboptimal therapy, poor adher adherence to therapy, right? Is the patient taking his medicine or not, right? Uh, do you have a patient with resistant hypertension or do you have a resistant patient with hypertension? Um, Extracellular volume expansion. It will be difficult to control blood pressure if they're if, uh, if they're not euvolemic. Uh, so uh, you know, in that case, a diuretic. If you haven't given a diuretic, you should. Um, uh, secondary hypertension due to some other cause, uh, office or white coat hypertension, uh, and the ingestions of uh, substances uh, which can elevate blood pressure. Okay, these are some of the secondary causes of resistant hypertension. Um, uh, sleep apnea, uh, renal parenchymal disease, primary aldosteronism is the big one. Renal artery stenosis is not terribly common uh, and can uh, actually be relatively easily diagnosed these days by, by ultrasound. Um, uh, but uh, primary aldosteronism is the, is the one you should think about, and I'll, I'll show you why in a little bit. Um, uncommon ones are pheochromocytoma, uh, Cushing's disease, hyperparathyroidism, aortic coartation, and an intracranial tumor. Um, if you diagnose aortic coartation early enough in life and the coartation is relieved, uh, you will cure that person's hypertension uh, for life. Well, presumably for life, uh, unless they otherwise develop it later on. Uh, uh, okay, so the management approach to resistant hypertension is first excluding other uh, exclude other causes, secondary causes, white coat uh, fag, medication non adherence, ensure a low sodium diet. Uh, I would change that to uh, under two thousand. Uh, not 2,400. Maximize lifestyle interventions, you know, dietary pattern, uh, encourage weight loss, encourage uh, exercise, uh, and uh, sleep. Sleep is uh, uh, a new risk factor that has been pointed out most recently by the Heart American Heart Association uh, as, as a risk factor for uh, cardiovascular disease. 
Then optimize your three drug regimen. Okay, uh, renin angiotensin uh, blocker, right? So an ACE or an R, uh, calcium blocker, diuretic at maximum uh, uh, or maximally tolerated dose. Again, appropriate for kidney function. So if you have low kidney function, uh, you want to go with a loop diuretic like furosemide as opposed to uh, hydrochlorothiazide. Okay, if the blood pressure is not at target, uh, uh, substitute chlorothalidone or endapamide for, for hydrochlorothiazide. If it's still not uh, at target, uh, here's spironolactone. Spironolactone or a plerinone uh, can, can lead to very dramatic uh, blood pressure reductions in people who have uh, hyperaldosteronism. Uh, so, so think about that uh, in, in your, in your patients who, who are uh, otherwise uh, not controlled. Um, you know, after that, add a beta blocker. Okay, still not a target, add hydrolyzine. Still not a target, uh, uh, substitute minoxidil for hydrolyzine. Um, uh, and that leads us to uh, uh, what is now uh, guideline-driven management of hypertension uh, with these these 10 uh, things to remember. You know, agree with, uh, you know, develop agreement with the patient on blood pressure targets. Uh, using fixed dose combinations reduces the number of pills that people take. Substitute long-acting chlorothalidone for hydrochlorothiazide. <laughs> uh, use amlodipine as your first-line calcium channel blocker. Monthly visits until blood pressure target is achieved. That's that's a biggie. That's one that I, I try to emphasize. Okay. Replace 30-day prescriptions with 90-day refills uh, to, to make it easier on the patient. The number of trips to the pharmacy. Uh, uh, use uh, telehealth strategies to augment office-based management. So if the, the patient doesn't want to come in every month, uh, but they take their blood pressure at home and keep a record of it. Uh, you can uh, manage uh, their their pressures uh, uh, via telemedicine, uh, uh, which is uh, extremely helpful, right? Uh, you know, enhance connectivity with the patient provider and electronic health record, right? Screen for social determinants of health. I'm sure that you all are very much aware of that, uh, considering uh, the obstacles to care and using a multidisciplinary team-based approach. Uh, so you utilize all of the uh, aspects uh, in your uh, that are available to you in your clinic uh, to try to achieve lifestyle uh, modification and medication adherence. Uh, and to try to solve uh, social issues. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, uh, lastly, I just wanted to put in, uh, to say, give you some idea of what's coming down the pike, uh, uh, the future of uh, uh, drug development. Uh, so there are aldosterone synthase inhibitors, which are in phase two trials, now two of them, uh, that have been successfully used and, and have been shown to lower blood pressure. Uh, the dual endothelian an antagonist uh, is now in a stage three trial. Um, and there's a vaccine against, against angiotensin two. I thought that was particularly interesting. Interesting. Uh, the other thing is that there, there is uh, uh, renal, denerv renal denervation that's available uh, by uh, catheter uh, that can be useful in some patients uh, who have resistant uh, hypertension. And uh, with that, uh, uh, I'll close with it's almost it's almost Valentine's Day uh, next week, and so here's a Valentine from a cardiologist. Absence makes the heart grow fonder and beta blockers and ACE inhibitors reduce cardiac remodeling. Thank you very much, everybody.
I love that. Thanks, Dr. Shulman. That was great. Lots of really good content there and tons of questions. As you can imagine, we see this every single day in primary care. So um, there are quite a few questions. I don't think we'll have time to go through them all, but want to encourage people that haven't had a chance to ask their questions. If you want to ask them orally, you can use the raise your hand feature. I'm happy to unmute you so you can talk to Dr. Shulman directly. Um, I'll go through as many as I can right now until the top of the hour. If your question isn't answered, Dr. Shulman's available on the Maven Project platform. You can always send him an e-consult directly with your questions for follow-up. Um, and you may have covered some of the questions that I will ask you, Dr. Shulman, in your talk, but I think it's a great um, opportunity to emphasize some of the questions and um, I'm sure other people have similar questions as well. So um, I'm gonna start with a question around hydrochlorothiazide. So the question is, why does anyone use hydrochlorothiazide when chlorthalidone is more effective and has a longer half-life? And second part is, what about thiazide use in people with a GFR less than 40? Okay. Um, uh, the chlorthalidone, uh, I mean, you're right, you're right about chlorthalidone. Um, hydrochlorothiazide is a weaker, a weaker diuretic and a weaker blood pressure uh, lowering agent. <clears throat> and so if you're concerned about uh, uh, lowering the blood pressure too much, perhaps an elderly person that you want to be care particularly careful with, you might start with hydrochlorothiazide as opposed to starting with chlorothalidone. Um, uh, I've started with chlorothalidone three days a week, for example, instead of instead of every day. Uh, the chlorothalidone 25 milligram tablet is difficult to cut. So three days a week is like half a pill. Um, uh, there's more hypokalemia with chlorothalidone because uh, for obvious reasons. And so that, that's, that's another issue. Uh, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, someone mentioned in the chat too that chlorthalidone used to be very expensive, so people may have just gotten out of the habit of prescribing it because HCTZ was more affordable. For well, the well, it is well, it is it is more expensive than um, than hydrochlorothiazide. I don't know if folks are are familiar with good RX, but they if they're not, they should be. Mm -hmm. uh, good RX is a, a website, P O O D R X, uh, where you can. Uh, buy medications not with insurance uh, at uh, really the cheapest prices, and they'll give you prices at different uh, at different pharmacies. So yeah. prices at at uh, uh, CVS and uh, Walgreens turn out to be much higher, even with good RX, mm -hmm. than at places like Walmart. Yeah, you just um, got to do a lot of the research to see where you can get it cheapest. Um, yeah, quick yeah. follow up question to that about. Um, chlorothalidone in the chat. So someone mentioned that they often have patients develop hypokalemia after starting chlorothalidone and wanted your thoughts on if a patient does have a normal kidney function, what's your rule of thumb for what level of potassium you'll allow a patient to have with regular follow-up? With regular follow-up, I would say, uh, well, if, if, you're, if you're normal, like ours is, is three and a half, uh, you know, then 3.4 or 3.3 would be about the lowest I would allow. Uh, <coughs> I would either be adding, um, I would either be adding uh, uh, potassium chloride or uh, one of my other strategies is to replace chlorothalidone with the spironolactone hydrochlorothiazide combination. That yeah. tends to minimize potassium changes and you utilizes spironolactone. If you're getting a lot of hypokalemia with, with chlorothalidone, you may very well be dealing with hyperaldosteronism. So the, the spironolactone will be, will be healthy. Great. That's a good answer. And I'm going to shift gears a little bit to a earlier question from the presentation. Um, so this question is about the use of um, home blood pressure monitoring cups. Um, and this provider wants to know, um, do you tell patients to avoid blood pressure monitors that use cuffs on other parts of the body, like the forearm or the wrists? Yeah. Um, 
uh, wrist cuffs are not as accurate as arm cuffs. So I encourage arm cuffs. Okay. Now I have one patient uh, uh, who's a type one diabetic. I only had one. Well, he's got he's got a, a, a glucose monitor on one arm and a glucose uh, you know uh, uh, continuous glucose infusion on the other arm. Mm -hmm. So you really can't take his blood pressure on his arms. Well, okay, in that case, he uses his wrist. But, um, uh, you know, unless unless that's the case, my I encourage uh, arm cuffs. And, and use the automated ones, right? Mm -hmm. Especially the ones that take three blood pressures and give you the average. If you think about it, in any of the, any blood pressure study, uh, the technique that's used is for the patient to be sitting in a room without the, without the provider, uh, with a blood pressure cuff that takes the blood pressure three times and then use it takes the average. And that's the blood pressure for that session. Great. I'm going to ask this question because I actually had this question as well while you were presenting. Um, so this attendee wants to know if you could explain the reasoning behind the proper way to take a blood pressure slide that you showed earlier on. Um, they stated that their patients are always stressed. They smoke a pack a day. They're talking the entire time. Um, so not necessarily a question, but I'm curious if you know the magnitude of the impact some of these factors have on blood pressure. Um, so combining my question with this attendee's question as well. Well, well, I would, I would uh, see if you can't. Uh, well, the 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 smoker. Uh, uh, I would, I would try to encourage that patient to come, <laughs> you know, as far in between <laughs> cigarettes as he could. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay, I mean, you know, people who are are truly. Uh, uh, addicted to cigarettes, you know, when they wake up in the morning, they've got to have a cigarette. So you can't, 